I think Spellman built my confidence in a way that I felt like I could do anything. I knew if I worked hard enough, I could do it. Um, I remember as a as a graduate student at Rice University, I went off to a stats PhD conference, uh, a stats a statistics conference, and this was probably my fourth year as a PhD student. And um, and I'm at this conference, and I'm you know meeting people, and I go to the registration table, and the woman's like, "Oh, welcome. Are you sure you're at the right place? Because there's another event down the hall that that maybe you're here for." And so that was the first moment where I was like, oh, well, why would you ask me that? Like, I can read, you know, and I walk up to the table, obviously, you know. And so I remember thinking, oh, that was weird. Um, and so uh, several times throughout the, the conference, uh, I was I was othered. People tried to help me. They thought I was lost. I tried to walk into the exhibit hall. They were like, oh, we need to see your badge. And I'm like, people are just walking past me, with, you know, no. And so this idea that I was in the wrong place or um, just didn't belong in the community was sort of the default assumption until I, you know, proved otherwise. I remember once I got asked to refill the coffee and I'm just thinking, oh, like I have no idea where the coffee, you know. Uh, but, you know, when I said, oh, I'm an attendee, I don't work here it was just like oh okay well you know who who refills the coffee you know it, there was no apology i'm so sorry i mistook you for one of the servers uh, and so i think those are the moments that made me question is this a, a place i want to be is this a community that i can belong to or will i always be seen as an outsider as someone who doesn't belong or who isn't a part of this group i mean i think people feel like either you're good at it or not, you know, and that's that's not true. I mean, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes perseverance, you know, like anything, learning how to play basketball. You know, uh, when you see guys in the NBA, the reason they're there is that they have practice and they've worked hard and, you know, and they failed. Uh, and I think math is the same. It takes a lot of practice. It takes hard work. You don't just sort of have innate talent and then all of a sudden you you are a mathematician. Um, people feel like it's only for certain types of people. It's only for smart folks or, you know, um, if, if you weren't born with that skill, you can't learn it. Uh, there's only one way to solve a problem. You know, I think especially for parents who learned math a certain way, often we, we feel like, well, that's the way I learned it and that must be the way to do it. But there's so many, you know, math has so many various ways that we can attack a problem, so many ways that we can really be creative in solving it. Um, and maybe I think the, the biggest misconception is that math is just irrelevant for everyday life. I mean, I think you will often hear people say, first, you know, they hate math. And two, what am I ever going to use this for? What am I going to use calculus for? You know, I've, I've never used math and I'm a full blown adult. And so I think people struggle with the real world application of mathematics and, you know, how it applies to their, their, their daily life, you know, um, how they use it in cooking, making a cake or budgeting. Like there's so many things that we use mathematics for that we often don't even think about. You know, well, mathematics really at its heart is is also a form of communication, right? So when we think about human language and it allows us to communicate in so many different ways, mathematics does that as well. Um, it's structured, right? We've got um, we've got rules. There's rules, grammatical rules to languages. There's syntax. You know, mathematics also has rules. We have symbols. We have notations. We have orders of operations. And so there's so many similarities. Uh, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, language also has cultural variations, right? And so you can go different places and folks speak French and they speak Spanish and they speak, you know, uh, Mathematics is universal. I can talk to someone in any language using mathematics and we can understand those shared numbers and, and systems. If you think most recently about uh, our, our COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, at the root of it was communicating numbers and data, right? It's spreading at this rate. This many people have passed away and from this disease, you know, this cure is, you know, only so effective. Um, and so really there's power in understanding mathematics and understanding what people are communicating with you when they present numbers in front of you and being able to interpret and digest that information. And so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool that can be used for good or, or not, right? And so I think it's, it's really important that we help the public understand mathematical ideas so that when they're presented information, when, when we're presented with, hey, you know, here's a 
here's a uh, um, here's a vaccine that we want you to take. The public can really wrestle with that uh, in a way that they feel satisfied with because they can understand the numbers that are being shown to them. Oh, goodness. Well, family would probably be at, at the top of that list. Uh, I've got three sons that are uh, a preteen and two teenagers. And so this is a really fun and exciting time for our family and their their lives. And it's it's great to sort of see how they're growing and developing and, and just becoming young men. Their voices are changing. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, I've been really active in my church community as well. I really enjoy uh, singing in the choir. We actually have a choir that, you know, uh, sings on Sunday morning. And so that's been just a great space because I'm not I'm not like the best singer, you know, I, they will never give me a solo. And so it's an environment where I can contribute and not have to be uh, good. I can I can make a joyful noise and it doesn't have to be perfect. And it's a space that I get to exist in and just uh, be, be one of many. Um, I'm also really enjoying doing a lot of public outreach and engaging the public in math and science and and getting young people excited about STEM and seeing themselves as as STEM professionals. And so that's really been where a lot of my labor and reward has been recently is how do we help this next generation see themselves as mathematicians, get excited about data science or statistics or engineering or, or, or whatever, um, and not start to pull away from the sciences. Uh, and so um, that's really been been a huge passion for mine, especially for women and for people of color to make sure that we're represented in these areas. They uh, they reached out shortly after the TED Talk came out. So this may have been 2015. And, and I think they'd seen the TED Talk and they said, hey, it's Lithia. We saw your TED Talk and we think we, we have this idea for a show that we'd love for you to host um, called Noble Wonders. And I, you know, initially I think I thought it was spam. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you also have some land you want me to buy, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so I reached out and and six episodes later, we had co-hosted, a, a, you know, this this series on some of the biggest questions in science. And so the TED Talk was really sort of what began that relationship. Since then, I've done some narration for several Nova shows and have you know, hosted Zero to Infinity and been on Prediction by the Numbers. And so it's been a really fruitful partnership um, with them. And, and it's been great to also sort of highlight the diversity of scientists and mathematicians and engineers and, and bring some of those voices to the table. Because often the folks who got highlighted when we were growing up, you know, in the 80s and 90s were, were mostly older white men at Ivy League institutions. And so the face of science was, is, was very different and is very different than the face that I think they want to promote. I think PBS is really conscious of the, 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 the child demographic that's watching their shows and making sure that they see themselves represented, you know, at all levels and, and definitely represented on NOVA and PBS as well. So I, I wrote the book Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics, and I really wanted to highlight uh, the, the journey of women sort of past, present, and up and coming who were in the mathematical sciences, uh, but their story, you know, where they were from, what they enjoyed doing, sort of what brought them into mathematics, what were some of the struggles that they faced. Um, in it are featured, you know, the, the first woman to get a PhD uh, in mathematics and some of the struggles that she went through at Columbia University with petitioning to get accepted into the program when they didn't accept women and being accepted, but having to only take classes by herself because they wouldn't let her take classes with the men because she'd be a distraction, you know, and having to petition to get approval for her PhD after she defended it because the board said, well, we don't want to be the first institution to give a woman a PhD in math. Um, I highlighted Eugenia Chang, who's sort of one of the more up and coming mathematicians and sort of being an Asian American woman in this mathematical space and her talking about belonging and, and uh, you know, broadening the field for, for other mathematicians. And so uh, it's, a, but it's also like a full color coffee table book. You know, you're not going to look through and see, you know, lots of boring equations, not that equations are boring, but, you know, uh, but it, it's it's very, you know, picturesque and just sort of highlights not just the beauty of these women, but sort of the, the boldness of them going into the field where, like your mother, they weren't always supported or encouraged.